are live. Guys, the live stream family is probably falling out of their chairs and spilling their popcorn right now. Hey, live stream family, we're on time. We don't know why, we don't know what happened, but we think it's something we might try to do a little more often. So anyway, we're gonna try it and see how much fun it is for everybody. So talking about time, um, I do have an important announcement and you will get an email about it uh, just because I want to make sure that everybody gets the announcement and a lot of our live stream family is not signed on yet so they'll miss the first part of this. Maybe they'll go back later and, and watch from the beginning. But in our staff meeting today, we, we brought it up for a vote and the consensus was that with time change coming up right around the corner just a couple of weeks and getting dark early and everything, um, kiddos needing to have plenty of time to get home and in bed for school and everything, that we are going to go ahead starting next Wednesday, we're gonna go back to 7 p.m. start time. How's that sound, everybody? Yay, okay, good. I was thinking that would be popular, especially with uh, those who, uh, we still have school age, um, I can't call her a kid anymore, she's 18, but we still have school agers. So teenagers, young ones, whatever, school agers. So that, I think that will be helpful. And then for those of you who have to get up and go to work early. And we're going to try this and see. And if we need to switch it back again in the summertime when things are a little more relaxed, you know, we'll visit that again. But for now, starting next Wednesday, we are going to start back again at 7 p.m. So, um, you know, eat a little earlier, meet a little earlier, and uh, we'll see you here a little earlier, which means we'll also finish a little bit earlier. So, yeah, right? That's the whole purpose, to get you guys out of here a little bit sooner so you can get home and... Uh, feed the animals and the children, so, right, not, not necessarily that order, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so um, I had another announcement. Um, oh, okay, the 8th and 9th of December, we are having a Hanukkah get-together. We're not really going to call it a conference because we're not going to have a whole bunch of people coming in, but Alyssa Elwine did say she would join us. <laughs> So we're excited about having that and having her join us. And, uh, uh-oh, what I miss? Oh, messing with Ryan? Okay. Well, tell me what I did. I'll do some more. <laughs> anyway, so next weekend, I mean, not next weekend, Hanukkah weekend. That's going to be December 8th and 9th. Um, we will send an email out about that, too, letting you know how to register. So there's not going to be a charge or anything, just a registration so that we'll know how many chairs to, to put out and so forth. And then, um, okay, that's all the announcements for this moment. We will go ahead and, uh, Mr. Holstey, would you mind coming and opening in prayer for us, please, sir? And if the rest of us, can you join us standing? Abba Yahweh, thank you for letting us come together again and worship you and hear wisdom about your word. And to that end, please give Eddie the words. And thank you so much for letting him come and speak to us. It's an honor and a privilege always to hear what he has to say. So we appreciate that and watch over us as we leave today in the dark. And next week, it'll be a little bit earlier. So we appreciate that. Thank you for all your blessings. In the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so at this time, we need to release the treasures. Ages four to nine. We'll go with Miss Nayla and her team. And if it's your first time for your child to go to this class, if you would kindly go and just give a little bit of information to the teachers, that would be appreciated. They won't hold you, but just a couple of minutes and you'll be right back in here. Okay, and they were ready to go. I heard one coming in going, am I the only treasure tonight? And he was like 20 minutes early. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Anyway, um, General Mrs. Dahl is over here for Junior Quiver. And the same thing goes if um, it's your child's first time, please go upstairs with them and give them a little bit of information for Junior and Senior Quiver as well. So when the children leave, a large portion of the congregation is gone. There's just a vacuum that happens. Uh, 
Okay. And now, oh, Sammy, you're going to be over there tonight, huh? Okay. Uh, tell me your rank again. General. General. Okay. General, young general, Mr. Dahl, over there. Um, if the senior quiver will go with him upstairs. Keep him in line, guys. Okay. Well, as Mr. Holsey um, mentioned, we have a special guest speaker tonight. Eddie's been in town for a few days, and um, he and Bill have gotten to spend some really good, intense time together, and uh, I can't wait to hear all about it. And, um, but he's not sharing that with us tonight. He's sharing something totally different. So if you don't know Mr. Eddie Chumney, tonight is your opportunity to get to know him. And if you do, you'll be happy to hear what he has to say. So without further ado, come on up, Mr. Eddie Chumney. Oh, sorry, psych. <laughs> you almost got that microphone. I do that to Bill all the time. <laughs> um, I forgot to tell you that once, um, Eddie will be taking the whole time tonight. He'll go right up until nine o'clock so that you'll um, get a really good dose of what he's going to deliver tonight. We will not be taking questions and answers at the end. We'll just dismiss uh, right before nine o'clock when he's finished and the children should be back in by that time. And at that time, we'll let him go home and get rested and refreshed for wherever he's headed next. Just uh, an FYI on that. Now you can have the microphone. Well, shalom, everybody. Shalom. Um, let me begin by saying that it's a privilege, joy, and honor that the God of Israel has given me to be able to be back here once again at Jacob's tent and to uh, share with you a message tonight that he has put upon my heart. So um, I believe in the sovereignty of the God of Israel. Uh, which means I don't believe it's possible that I would be here tonight without his permission. So I'd like to always thank Yeshua for making it possible for um, me to be here tonight and to share with you. And when I do come here, I get to spend time with Bill and Beth, and um, they are like the best people in all the world. And they're courteous, gracious, loving, hospitable. They're genuine. They're sincere. They help others. Um, they give their servants. So the people here at this congregation are really blessed to be able to have them as your leaders. It really is a blessing from the God of Israel. And so I am honored and blessed to have their friendship, and I highly value our relationship. And so as a result, I want to thank you and Bill for allowing me to come and share tonight. That being the case, I was told one time that ministry brings forth from relationships and building relationships and from establishing close relationships with those who you can trust and those who are near and dear to you. People that can work with you in a situation where you care for one another and you support one another. Um, my dad once said, actually he said this many times, that your success is my success. In other words, we are a team and we need to see ourselves as a community. So that being the case, I would like to read from Psalm in chapter 133. Psalm chapter one, uh, 133 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment. 
as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there, when brethren dwell together in unity, for there the Lord commanded the blessing and even life forevermore. And to add to that, I'd like to share with you from Ephesians chapter four, verse three. Or we might uh, begin in verse three. So Ephesians in chapter four, verse three, it says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of shalom, because there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then also in the spirit of First Timothy, I'm sorry, First Peter, First Peter, First Peter chapter one, in verse 22, it says, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren and see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. So this is our calling and our responsibility to the Lord and it is our responsibility to each other. Jacob's Tent is a bridge-building ministry, and I welcome and I support those efforts. However, as we all know in the faith, unity doesn't always mean uniformity because all of us, even in here, we express our faith in Yeshua, we express our faith in how we seek to follow the Torah in sometimes slightly different ways. And so that being the case, the title of my message tonight is Religion Versus Relationship. And what is most important? So religion is those things we do habitually to express our faith. And when we put um, our expression on outward things, above our relationship with brothers and sisters in the faith, without the mortar of love and mutual respect, that is when we fail as a congregation. That's when we fail as a body. So I'd like to read to you Hebrews in chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 14, it says, Follow shalom with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And so I'd like to share with you quite a few scriptures here, um, comparing and contrasting religion versus relationship. And what we should be striving is, of course, the relationship. So we're going to begin by looking at Matthew in chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, uh, to see what religion looks like. Matthew chapter 23, in verses 5 and 6, it says, But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the uttermost room at feasts and chief seats in the synagogue. So this is what religious people do. But what Yeshua instructed us in following the faith is Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Matthew chapter 3, verse 20. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. However, you have omitted the weightier matters of the Torah, which is judgment. That's the Hebrew word mishpat. 
in uh, its mishpatim, plural. And mishpat is the category of commandments regarding how you treat other people and the other way, in the way to treat other people properly. So that's a weightier matter of the Torah along with mercy and faith. And so let's continue to look at quite a few more examples of these things and what Yeshua is trying to teach us through it. So the first one, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9 and verses 9 to 13. Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 9. And as Yeshua passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. So this is somebody seeking to follow um, with the sincerity of their heart, Yeshua, as Messiah. It says in verse 10, that it came to pass as Yeshua sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the, when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why do you, why eats the master with publicans and sinners? But when Yeshua heard that, he said before them, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go and learn what it means by the saying, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Mercy, that's one of the weightier matters of the Torah. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Our next example is still in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 to 7. Matthew in chapter 12 and beginning in verse one. And at that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And he said unto them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And they that were with him and how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the Torah how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. And so Yeshua is giving two examples here that I've shared with you so far on the meaning of the weightier matters of the Torah as it relates to mercy. And so... Um, hopefully you can begin to see, and I'm going to keep giving you more examples, that there's a comparison and a contrast to the religious-minded person that's all focused on uh, making sure things and how they are done, the form, and they're missing the heart of the matter. Uh, they're missing the essence of the purpose. They're, they're missing the relationship. So the next one now is in Luke in chapter 10. This is another teaching of Yeshua regarding um, what mercy looks like as it relates to the conflict with what I'm calling and labeling religion. Um, Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25 through verse 37. So this is Luke chapter 10, 25 to 37. Verse 25 reads... And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? 
And he said unto him, what is written in the Torah? How do you read it? How do you interpret it? And he answered and said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, you have answered correctly. This do and you shall live. So Yeshua is quoting and making a reference there to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, but we continue. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Yeshua, Now, who is my neighbor? So Yeshua answered and said, Well, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed and left him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So look, the priest is trying to be religious. He has to get to where he's going on time. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him and passed by. So instead of doing uh, what the Torah would have them do, they've they're got to go to their religious spot to do their religious thing. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn, and he took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him, and whatsoever... He spends more. When I come again, I will repay you. Now, which one of these three do you think was a neighbor unto that that fell upon the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then Yeshua said, go and do likewise. So you see the difference between how a re religious pe person thinks and does and how um, we are called to be the doer? like James says, the doer of the Torah. And so those are three examples um, that I wanted to share with you um, that Yeshua gave us of what he meant by the weightier matters of the Torah, emphasizing the mercy part. Now, I'm going to uh, get to the, uh, the next one, which is judgment, which is mishpat, which is how you treat other people. And the first example I want to go with is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. Isaiah and uh, chapter 1 and verse 11. You know, I can find this a lot faster when I have two hands, so this helps for when they want to put the, the verses up there on the screen for y'all. So Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 11, and then I'm going to continue on and do 13 to 15. First, verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of goats. Verse 13, bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination unto me, the new moons and the Sabbath and the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity. Even the solemn assembly, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble unto me. I am wary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Now, here's the point. You know, your hands are full of blood. Okay, so the point isn't the Lord didn't want all these things done because he told for all those things to be done, okay? Okay. So what he's complaining about is when you're doing these things while your hands are full of blood. In other words, the way I'm going to phrase it is, they were being religious outwardly. Uh, they were doing those things that they were used um, habitually, how to express their, their religious behavior, um, but they weren't doing according to the heart matter of the Torah. And what is the heart matter then that he wanted to emphasize to them? It is verse 17. That's Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. Learn to do well. Seek mishpat. 
That's the way to your matter of the Torah. Seek mishpat. And what does that look like? Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, and plead for the widow. My next example regarding this same understanding is Jeremiah in chapter 7 in verses 1 to 3. Jeremiah in chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O you of Judah, and enter in at the gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. In verse four, trust not in lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. So I'm giving you the same theme, but many examples. And so um, it's the attitude of the people that they're going to their religious place of worship, um, but their hearts are far from him. They're not doing um, the heart of the Torah. Now, we're going to uh, look at Jeremiah 7, verses 5 to 7. It says, If you will thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you will thoroughly execute mishpat between man and his neighbor, if you will treat um, your neighbor properly, if you will oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Continuing on with the same understanding and thought process is Isaiah in chapter 58 in verses three and four. Isaiah chapter 58 in verses three and four, it says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you see not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. You fast because you want other people to see things your way. And you smite with the fist of wickedness, and you shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. The Lord's response is verses six through eight, same chapter. Verse six, is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and you break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? that you bring the poor and you cast out to the house when you see the naked, that you cover them, that you hide not yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth as the morning and your house shall spring forth speedily and the righteous shall go before you and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear word. In other words, he is going to go before you. All right. While we're on a roll, yet another example. This is uh, Amos in chapter 8. Amos chapter 8 in verses 4 and 5. So, you know, I'm giving you so many examples because I want you to see that this is no small issue to the God of Israel. And this is one of the things he had the prophets to go complain to his people Israel regarding in Amos chapter 8, in verses 4 and 5, it says, Hear this, O you that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn in the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great? See, they're going to do their religious thing, but when it's all over, they're going to go back to their bad behavior and falsifying the balances by deceit. But what's the Lord's heart? What does he want done? Amos in chapter five, verse 15. Amos 
in chapter 5 and verse 15. Hate the evil, love the good, and establish mishpat in the gate. And it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. And I still got a couple more examples. Uh, The first one is Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6 and verses 6 through 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 reads, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to do justly, that's judgment, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So the next example is Zechariah in chapter 7. So all these things that the Lord wants done, Yeshua called it the weightier issues of the Torah, and this is the Father's heart. This should always be our focus in expressing our faith, is these and on these things. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 4 to 6. Zechariah 7, verses 4 to 6. Then came the, then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying... Speak unto the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and the seventh month, even those seventy years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you did eat and when you did drink, did you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? And now verses 8 to 10. The word of the Lord came up to Zechariah, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, execute true mishpat and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. So, In living out and expressing our faith, um, we are called to love truth and to walk in truth. But what is truth? Psalm 119 and verse 142. Psalm 119 and verse 142 says... Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. So the truth is the Torah, and we can also see this from Malachi chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 6. Malachi and chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 6. And now, O you priests, this commandment is for you. Verse 6, the Torah of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. So I just gave you a couple examples where the Bible defines that the Torah is truth. And so when we seek to walk in truth, we seek to, to walk in following the Torah, Now we're going to look at, uh, well, um, we're going to get here first. Psalm 86, verse 11. Psalm 86 and verse 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. So the Torah is truth, and we're supposed to walk in.
and verse 4. 3 John and chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. So the Torah is truth, and we're supposed to walk in truth. However, the way that we follow the Torah and walk in truth is Paul instructs us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, to speak the truth in love. So we're going to read that. Um, Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things. You see, this is how we grow up in Messiah. We don't ignore the truth, but we have to speak the truth in love. We have to do it with the right heart, the right spirit, the right motive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Messiah. So now I'm going to give you an example of what Paul shared from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, of what he called a carnal Christian or a babe in Messiah, one who is young in Messiah. So, um, you know, we're all human beings, and it's the Holy Spirit works and tugs on our hearts, and he draws us to Yeshua, and that's what causes us uh, to even believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, but you know how when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they, they still had Egypt in them? So even when we come to Messiah, John, our heart, we still have a flesh. And you know, we got to drag our flesh with us. And, it, and it's a process to crucify the flesh and grow in the Lord and grow in the Spirit. It's a process. It, it just doesn't happen immediately and right away. And so um, that's the reason why uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as a babe in Messiah. So a carnal, a carnal, it, carnal-minded is a babe in Messiah. Now, what's going to be the characteristics? Now, these are, these are believers in Yeshua as the Messiah, but they're babes. It says, I have fed you with milk. Well, that's a characteristic. Um, that they're only able to partake of milk of the word and not the meat of the word. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are you now able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envians and strifes and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Um, but the ministry of the kingdom of God is a team effort. We have to be a team, see us ourselves as a team, work together, uh, be a community. And Paul's expressing this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in verses 6 through 9. It says, I have planted, Apollos has watered, but it's God that gave the increase. You see, it's all about God and his kingdom. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither is he that waters, but it's all God that gave the increase. And so now we have joint reward when we do our part in the kingdom because it's a team. It says, now he that plants and he that waters are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are labors together with God, and you are God's husbandman, and you are God's building. So when you're religious, you just focus on you and the things that concern you, and you're not thinking of the bigger picture. But when you're more spiritual, you realize that you are a part of a team. You are a part of the kingdom of God. You're a part of the body of Messiah. And he wants us all to work together to accomplish fruit for his kingdom uh, and to give glory to his name. However, the challenge is, is that we're not all on the same spiritual level. 
So we can see this going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as a babe and Messiah. You see, one that's spiritual and one that's carnal, it's two different levels. So we're not all on the same level. We can also see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. So 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. So as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. So, you know, a congregation uh, like this where God's drawn people in from all over, even all over the country, um, there's got to be some people that's sitting here um, that's been following this way and this path for 20 years. But then you're going to have somebody come in here next week and they don't even know anything about. They don't even know what the Sabbath is about. And so we all have to work as a team uh, to help each other because we're all not going to be on the same place in the same spiritual level. So just to show you that, um, uh, that there's spiritual levels, um, one other example of this is Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 12 to 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you're become such as need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Now, when you're a babe, it's appropriate to have milk. But after a certain period of time, uh, you know, it becomes inappropriate. So, but everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. He is a babe, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of youth, of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You see that there's different spiritual levels there, and the goal is, how we read this in the English, is full age. And so we have to help one another um, and, and so that we all could be lifted up because uh, the goal is to come to the fullness um, of the stature of Messiah. And let's see if I can find that. I think that's in Ephesians in chapter 4. And let's see what verse it is. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4... Verse 11 and verse 13. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. But he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And so he gives the fivefold ministry uh, to help us to grow. Um, and so obviously, uh, the leadership here, um, uh, Bill and Beth, God has called them uh, to help the body here uh, to grow. Uh, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of Man, unto a perfect man. You see that word perfect? It got translated over there in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 as full age. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Messiah. So that's what we're striving for. And it is, is that we come to faith in Messiah and it's a process uh, that ultimately, though, the goal is to grow up into Messiah, and we need one another to do that. Uh, uh, everyone needs to help everyone else to do that. And we need the fivefold ministry to help in that endeavor as well. Now, growing up to that higher place is what Paul is going to call the high calling of God. And he speaks about this uh, high calling of God in Philippians, in chapter 3. Philippians in chapter 3, in verses 10 to 14. It says, um, Paul is praying that I may know Messiah and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. And if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection that he's talking about a spiritual status now, Okay. And then he says, not as though I've already attained it, 
But Paul already knew that Yeshua is the Messiah, so he's not talking about getting saved. He's talking about growing up in Messiah, and Paul is desiring himself to grow up in Messiah. Uh, it says, not as though I had already attained, either were already mature, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Messiah Yeshua. Brethren, I count it, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth with those things which are before. And I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Messiah Yeshua. And I'm gonna then read verse 15 as well. Let us therefore as many as be mature have this mindset. And if, and if, uh, anything be otherwise minded, if anyone be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. So uh, in the kingdom, since we're all at different levels, there's those that are stronger than others and those who are weaker. And regarding that, we're told in Romans, in chapter 15, verse one, Romans chapter 15, verse one, it says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to try to focus on ourselves, not to try to please ourselves. So um, we are not called to be religious with the God of Israel, but what he wants us to have, he wants our hearts to be right, and he wants us to have a personal intimate relationship with him. And uh, Amos, in chapter three, verse three, um, speaks regard this matter. Amos, chapter three, in verse three, it says, can two walk together, and I'm reading from uh, into English, except they be agreed the Hebrew is actually deeper and stronger than the English translation agreed. Um, it's actually the Strong's number 3259 in the Strong's uh, Hebrew dictionary. It's the Hebrew word yahat, yahad, yahad. So I'm going to give you two examples where this word is found so we can understand it, what it means about two walking together, what that's supposed to look like, Okay. So the first example where this word is found is Exodus chapter 21, verse 9. In Exodus chapter 21, in verse 9, it says, and if he had betrothed her unto his son, it's the word betrothed. You see, betrothed isn't just, you know, your friends out here. Um, we're talking about something closer and the second example is Exodus chapter 25 and verse 22. Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, where it says, and there will I meet with you. It's the word meet. There I will meet with you. I will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony. And so... The place that God is calling to meet him at is that word that got translated as how can two walk together unless we be agreed. So we're, we're talking about a close um, personal relationship that you're going to have with someone. You have to have that close personal relationship and know each other's heart and help one another um, um, is how we are called to walk together. So when we come together and we study and learn of God's word, we study not to be religious, but it's for the purpose to get to know the king of Israel, to get to know Yeshua, and to learn the ways of his kingdom. And so ultimately what we're trying to achieve is 
we want to learn the character of God. We want to study to learn the character of God. And part of learning the character of God is learning his ways. We're going to look at Psalm 103 and verse 7. Psalm 103 and verse 7. I've always liked this verse. It says, He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The way I like to look at this verse is there's a difference between knowing the acts of God and the ways of God. And so we want to know the ways of God, um, not just his acts. Because Moses was more mature when he knew the ways of God. The children of Israel were were more immature when they only knew the acts of God. Secondly, in learning the character of God, we want to then express his character in us and through us as we are living our lives and seeking to follow his Torah. And because the God of Israel wants to express himself through us, and Yeshua expressed it this way in Matthew in chapter 5 and verse 16. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he said... Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we are to show forth or express the character of God to others and to show forth his character that's working through you, um, ultimately that it could come upon and be a blessing unto others. And by doing so, we bring forth the kingdom of God on earth in our lives in the way in which we interact with others. So the way in which we interact with others, Yeshua expressed it this way, the greater your matter, the weightier matters of the Torah is mercy and judgment. And I just gave you the examples of, and those examples were how we interact with others. So we seek to do the Father's will in our lives in the following ways. Number one, by serving others. Galatians chapter five and verse 13. Galatians chapter five, verse 13. It says, for brethren... You have been called unto liberty, but only use that liberty, but um, do not use that liberty for the occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. And also he wants us to lay down our lives for others. Let's look what Yeshua did for us in John in chapter 10, verse 15. John chapter 10, verse 15 says, As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So now Yeshua laid down his life for us, and what does he want us to do in response? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he has laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And in doing so, by learning the character of God, seeing the example that Yeshua has already lived out before us, we are then supposed to, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, he that says he abides in him or he that says he's a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself so to walk, even as he walked. And so, when you're trying to express your faith in the right way and, and with the right heart, when you seek 
uh, to walk in truth because people are at different levels. Um, how you are expressing your walk and your faith may not be the same level in the same way that somebody else is doing it, yet they're still in the faith. They're still of the body. They're still in ministry. They're still congregational leaders. And uh, particularly with those um, in the body, in ministry, that you value your relationship with, while you endeavor to walk in truth and, and, and grow in your own personal spiritual maturity, it's not wise to burn bridges with others, particularly those whose relationships you value, um, either in the congregation or, um, you know, other leaders of congregations or other leaders of ministries. So we are not all on the same spiritual level. And because of that, when we're immature and we're zealous, we can tend to be what has been called, I've heard this over the years in the movement regarding different things, a Torah terrorist. Okay, so you got to be patient with people, right? And it's actually a Torah command to be patient with people, as we can see in Exodus chapter 23, verse 9. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 9. It says, You shall not oppress a stranger for you know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers, you know the heart of a stranger. If your testimony is similar to mine, you know, you know how I grew up in the faith? I grew up going to a Sunday Protestant church. And I grew, I grew up at, for sure, till the time I was 25. That's when the process started to change. And I started going to church when I was five. And in those 20 years, I did not miss that many Sundays. I mean, I was serious about going to church. I had to, I, uh, I had to go to, uh, uh, to church all the time. Um, and so, but how I was shown to live out my faith um, was to celebrate Christmas and Easter. And um, I ate eggs and bacon every day for breakfast. I mean, that's what breakfast was, okay? So I've been there. You've probably been there as well. But the Lord somehow, some way, showed us this way that we're walking on now. And so if someone else is a little bit back there or they're just starting the process, that's what it means by um, you know the heart of a stranger, seeing that you were strangers. So you should know because you were there at one time too. So um, we need to be sensitive uh, to... Uh, those who are the Lord is still awakening and showing particular things to those that are babes in Messiah and, and those who are babes and and uh, and trying to understand and express their faith in Yeshua by following His Torah. But ultimately, what how we should be striving to live our lives in Him is um, how we know um, that He's really working and dealing in our lives and in our heart is when we can show evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. So let's look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and it's uh, verse 22. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith... And it continues. And so the only way that we can mature so that we're showing forth the fruit of the Spirit is we have to crucify the flesh. And so uh, let's look at what Paul had to say about crucifying the flesh. Let's look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of the sin might be destroyed, that we should not serve sin. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 8, it says, 
Romans 8, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And then Romans chapter 13, verse 14. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. But put on Messiah Yeshua and make no provision make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. And then finally, Galatians in chapter 5 and verse 24. Galatians chapter 5 in verse 24. They that are Messiahs have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So, we're talking about our goal is to study and learn the heart of God, learn the character of God, live it out in you to others so they can see it and understand it as well. So now we're going to look at um, characteristics and, that, and associated with knowing the character of God. First of all, um, you are not to give glory to yourself but you, are, you should be living your life in him so that he receives the glory. Jeremiah, in chapter 9, in verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah, chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Um, it says, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. It's so not in you, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, mishpat, and righteousness in the earth, for it's in those things that I delight, says the Lord." Now we're going to look what Paul has to say about the subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, in verse 21. It says, therefore, let no man glory in men. But, of course, it means that the Lord be glorified. So, uh, don't glory in yourself but let the glory come to the Lord. And um, furthermore, an understanding and knowing the character of God is God is a God of truth. Exodus chapter 34 and verse six. Exodus chapter 34 and verse six. It says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He's a God of truth. And then Psalm 119, verse 142. So the God of Israel is a God of truth. But what is truth? Psalm 119, verse 142. It says, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is the truth. He's a God of truth. Truth is a Torah, that means he follows his own Torah. And the way that we're supposed to serve him or live for him is in truth. We know him, he is truth, and we walk in truth, which means we walk in the Torah. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14 says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things that he has done for you. So he's not only a God of truth, but he's a God of mercy and goodness. Going back to Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord passed by before and proclaimed, the Lord 
the Lord God merciful and gracious. Then Psalm in chapter 63 and verse 3. Psalm 63 and verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. His mercy, his goodness. And his truth and his mercy is to be written upon our heart. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Proverbs in chapter 3 and verses 3 and 4. It says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you, but bind them about your neck. Write them upon the table of your heart. And in doing so, you will find favor and good understanding in both the sight of God and in the sight of men. So he's a God of truth, mercy, goodness. And all of his ways are mishpat. All of his ways are judgment. The weightier matters of the Torah. Deuteronomy in chapter 32, verse 4. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect for, for all of his ways are judgment. All of his ways are mishpat, the weightier matters of the Torah. And Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8. For I, the Lord, I love mishpat. I love judgment. The way to your matters of the Torah is faith, judgment, and mercy. So uh, the God of Israel is a God of truth, mishpat, and righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 2. And you will swear the Lord lives in truth, in mishpat, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Isaiah chapter 16, verse 5. Isaiah chapter 16 and verse 5. It says, And in mercy shall Messiah's throne be established. And Messiah is going to sit upon his throne in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking mishpat and hastening righteousness. And so um, whenever we, f we follow the God of Israel in this way, um, we are going to be spiritually elevated and our flesh is going to be crucified in the process. And where our spiritual destination is, is Mount Zion. That's our spiritual destination in him. And so in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 6. Psalm chapter 2 verse 6. I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So Zion is his holy hill. Now Psalm chapter 15 verses 1 to 5. Who will abide in, the, in his tabernacle and who will dwell in his holy hill? That's Mount Zion. Who's going to get to that highest place in God? Well, this is who's going to do it. He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbites not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not, and he that puts not out his money to usury, nor takes reward against the innocent, he that does these things shall never be moved. Well, um, you know what it is that will not be moved. Um, it is uh, those in Mount Zion. 
Psalm 125, verse 1. Psalm 125, verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. So that is why Yeshua told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20, that we are to uh, store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 20. It says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven that where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break through or steal. Have I given you enough information so that you now know what that means? Hopefully so. And so um, we should desire to strive to be great in the kingdom of God. But how, what's the process by which we would be great in the kingdom of God? Well, let's read Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. At the same time came the disciples unto Yeshua, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Yeshua called a little child and set him in the midst of them. And verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. But whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of God. So you have to humble yourself to be the greatest in the kingdom. But what does a real young child do, one that's two years old? They're completely trusting. And if they're trusting, they, they have faith. So the weightier matters of the Torah is mishpat, mercy, and faith, like a little child. And so he who humbles himself. Well, Micah refers to this in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah in chapter 6. In verse 8, it says uh, something to like, uh, what does uh, the Lord require of you? Let's see what it says. Um, he has showed you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, that's mishpat, to love mercy, there's mercy again, and now he adds to walk humbly with your God. And so in order to be, great or the greatest in the king of heaven, um, we need to be servants. We need to serve others. Back to Matthew in chapter 20 and verses 26 to 28. Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 to 28. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever will be Greatest among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in serving others, we need to bear each other's burdens. Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 2. Galatians in chapter 6. In verse 2, it says, bear one another's burden. And that's how you fulfill the Torah of Yeshua. And we are to serve one another in love. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. For brethren, you have been called into liberty, into liberty. Only use not liberty for the occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. So um, it just happens that I'm here speaking to um, the Jacob's Tent congregation. So that's why I'm using you um, as uh, my object lesson here. So uh, when you come to Jacob's Tent, um, don't come to criticize Bill in the leadership or other people in the congregation, but strive to be in unity with each other. 
But unity does not mean complete uniformity of faith in Messiah and how you walk out the Torah. Understand that. It's almost impossible for anybody here to agree on exactly anything because, because to agree on everything because we have different understanding of the scriptures and that we're at different levels of our walk. But um, when you come here, ask yourself a question. How can I seek to make the congregation stronger? Um, how can the Lord use me to bless others? So be on the focus, have others in your mind and not you and what you're hoping and expecting and believing things to be. And if things aren't quite right, you get disappointed. Because if you look at you and what you want, I almost guarantee you you'll get disappointed. But have the Lord's heart. Come with a servant's heart. And um, look for ways to serve the congregation and also look for ways to serve each other. Love each other and look at the congregation as your family. And as well as that's the way you view things here in your local congregation, you also need to see yourself as a part of a community of believers with a community with other congregations and other ministries of like-minded faith. And that in doing so, if you practice these behaviors and if you have this mindset, now you should know the difference between trying to be religious in your expression of faith in the congregation in contrast to what the Lord wants, which is having a personal relationship with Yeshua and walking in love with your fellow brethren. And so in closing... Remember always these words of Yeshua uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. And so um, after I get done reading to you this scripture, um, uh, then we're going to have a closing song, okay? And then um, after that song will be the ultimate closing and the dismissal. So we're going to look at... Uh, remember always the words of Yeshua in Matthew chapter... 7 and verse 12, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so unto them. That's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So ask yourself when you're talking to, to others, when you're interacting with them, um, am I treating the person who I'm interacting with the way that I would want them to treat me? Because that's the measuring stick by Yeshua, um, how he wants us to, to measure how we interact with other people. And in that way, we are following the heart of the Torah and the prophets, and we are now living out what Yeshua called the weightier matters of the Torah. So hopefully um, I've shared and explained uh, to you the difference between someone who I labeled as, hopefully I tried to define it, um, as someone that's being religious um, uh, compared to um, uh, somebody um, who is striving uh, to have a relationship with others and with Yeshua and in the God of Israel. So once again, uh, to Bill and Beth uh, 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 and the congregational leaders here, thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to come and share. And I pray that all of you have been blessed in the message and it's encouraged you in your walk in Yeshua. And if it has, please give all praise, glory, and honor to Yeshua, because without him, we're nothing. And so he deserves all of our praise, glory, and honor. And so in order to remind us of the heart of this message, we're now going to do this song.
okay, sorry, I should have already been up here, but I was really into, I was, I was thinking, okay, where are our dancers? I'm not usually the one who jumps out and leads everybody, and I kept waiting for them to come around, but I forgot a lot of our young people are still upstairs in classes, and some of them aren't, and they didn't jump out. <laughs> it's okay, next time. Um, you can have a seat for a minute if you like. Um, we have a few more minutes before the rest of our young people come back in. And I just want to thank you, Eddie, for coming and speaking tonight. Yeah, go ahead. We're very grateful to you know, have someone that, um, of your caliber in your walk to come in um, and, and share with us tonight. Eddie, if you don't know him, he's very sincere. He's a humble guy. He's, uh, he's grateful. If you spent much time around him, you know he's very grateful for, you know, what might seem like a tiny thing to somebody else. He's just very grateful. Um, he's very thorough, and if you didn't know that before tonight, you definitely know it tonight. If he tells you something, he will most definitely back it up with scripture. I have three pages of notes, and I write as tinier than an ant. So, you know, to get as much as I can on one piece of paper, because I've been accused of killing too many trees. So, you know, it's, I'm a note taker. What can I say? But he's very, very thorough, and I do appreciate that. Um, it's one thing about my husband I appreciate. If he's going to tell you something, he's going to be able to back it up with Scripture, and I think that's why he and Eddie enjoy you know, talking so much. Um, and then the men in here that he's gotten to know, and we had um, Mr. Lane speak on Shabbat, and uh, some of you other men that he has had to speak, um, I think you all share that in common. And I think everybody's who's here is probably here for that reason, that you're the kind of people that you want it to be backed up. You want it to be grounded in the word. You want to be able to go and point your finger there to make sure you stay grounded. And if you ever need to take somebody else and show them where their grounding is, you can go to the word and point it out. So we appreciate how thorough you are too, Eddie. Um, and on top of that, he's a great sport. He was representing with... The wardrobe tonight, did you see? He has on the Jacob's Tent t-shirt. That was part of his birthday present from Jacob's Tent last year. We were blessed to have him come by around Thanksgiving, which is also around the time of his birthday. And, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that was your first ever birthday party? Well, I don't have them very often. Okay, doesn't have them very often. So the first one in a long, long time. Yeah. And Okay. So um, we were blessed to share that with him, and it was a real treat. And so that was uh, one of his birthday presents from Jacob's Tent last year. So I'm pleased to see that you still like in the wardrobe. So anyway, just a reminder, um, you're going to have a few minutes to visit here because the rest of the family's not back in yet with the youngsters. But just a reminder, in case uh, some of our live stream family, if you didn't hear this notice at the beginning, and I, I can't see you through the glare on these glasses. I hope that's better. Now I'm just, you're a big blur. I hope I'm getting somewhere in there. But um, we will go to 7 p.m. to meet um, starting next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Wednesday evening next week um, with time change and everything coming up and it getting darker sooner. And, and here in Tennessee, um, it gets dark pretty early once that time change uh, happens. So we think that's going to help a lot with some of the activities and getting the youngsters home a little sooner, feeding them, getting them in bed and everything. So we didn't want you to miss that. And so if you'll help spread the word, we'll all get the email out again, remember, and um, all of you spread the word to your neighbors who couldn't be here tonight um, and remind them to check their emails. Um, and if there aren't any other announcements, oh, well, let me just remind you in case some of our live streamers were not on earlier, uh, December 8th and 9th. We will have um, a Hanukkah gathering. Like I said, it's not going to be a, a full-blown big conference. We will we'll be using the OCI building again. We're very grateful for that relationship there and continuing to be able to um, use their facilities. Um, we will have Halisa Elwine with us, which, yay, I'm very happy about that. I enjoy her teaching, as do uh, a lot of you here. We really are happy when she's able to come and visit and uh, with her husband, Alan. And uh, usually they're little Frenchie dogs, which are their babies, so... If you're a dog person, you'll, you'll love them extra. But uh, if you missed that announcement, we will have an email that's going to go out to show you how to register for that. Um, just be looking for that, I'm guessing, probably sometime next week. Um, 
It's a pretty busy week this week, so don't expect it before the end of this week. Look for it next week. And if you have any questions, of course, we'll be available at the office for you to call or to email. So if there aren't any other announcements, does anybody have anything that I'm missing? Anything that we need to... Uh, lost and found. If you haven't been up there, go check that out. Uh, we did have a lot left over from Sukkot, things that were brought back. So if you've not gone up to retrieve that yet, I've not been up there to see if it's still there. Maybe you will get lucky and it'll still be there. But at this point, let's stand up and turn around and say hi and bye to our live stream family. If you will, turn around and look at camera number two with Miss Lori. Happy Wednesday. We're happy that you're here with us. We're jealous that you're already home in your pajamas with popcorn. But, you know, we are happy that we get to be here and, and, and fellowship with each other and, you know, talk about each other's pajamas and favorite popcorn. So, anyway, um, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye to the live streamers now, and uh, we will see you on Shabbat. And then for the rest of you, if you want to just visit for a few minutes before your youngsters come back in, that would be great. Remember, 7 o'clock.